Now, I've been ministering on the subject of how things work. And this is week six on how things work. Why are you teaching on how things work? So you know how things work. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Giving you enough of an understanding so that an individual can fully appreciate what God's word says about this matter. Now, of course, we've looked at all the different laws of God, and we know that word numos in the Greek, the word law, praise God, principle, hallelujah. We know something in Scripture is called law because it works every time. Amen. We know that Romans 3.27, I've covered with you further, uh, the Scripture tells us there is the law of faith. We know the Greek word for faith is pistis. We know it's name our Bible schools we have around the world. Amen. And that uh, pistis particularly means trust. Okay, it means belief. It's to rely on, to be assured on, praise God, all that. When you talk about uh, faith, praise God. So there's the law of that. We know that Hebrews 10.38 also told us we looked at. It said that just means those who are born again. The just shall live by faith. What he didn't say was not that to just use faith. He said that to just live by faith. And I told you to actually, the actual Greek around that means that they have a lifetime and a lifestyle of trust, confidence, belief, and assurance upon God and his word. And then also we've looked at James 1.22. It said, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. So if a man be a hearer of the word but is not a doer of the word, it says he's like a man who beholds his face in the glass, forget of what kind of man he was. Amen. But whoso looketh into the perfect, talking about the Bible, perfect law of liberty, but continue with therein, that man will be blessed in his deed. Now, praise God, I want to teach you some more about faith, but I want to teach it to you again at a little different level. Because oftentimes uh, people mistake faith and faith's mechanisms. The things that I teach you about five elements of faith, what I'm teaching you about when I wrote the book on it, is to help you understand what the mechanisms of faith are, how they work in order for you to access the promises that God has made available to you. Uh, amen. Amen. But that's not what he's talking about in Hebrews 10, 38. Amen. Now, believe in God for your healing and for your financial miracle or for deliverance from some issue is quite legitimate. God put those promises in the scripture because he expects you to do what's necessary to receive because that's his will. Amen. But that's not really what faith's about. Today, I'm going to give you what faith is really about. So let's read Psalm 138, and let's read here verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy Shem. That's the Hebrew word for name. It's the equivalent to the word name in the New Testament, which is onama, thought and character. So it's Shem in the Hebrew. I will praise thy Shem for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Now, you need to underline that word truth because that's what's setting up the rest of the verse. For thou hast magnified or made large thy word above thy name. And so God and his word are inseparable. If you're talking about God, you are talking about his word. And if you're talking about his word, you are talking about God. There is no difference between the two. Amen. So when you understand that then, rejection of any part of the word of God is a personal rejection of God himself. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24, uh, 35. Jesus said that not one doubt or tittle of the words of Pastor away. He said heaven and earth will first. See, so God has magnified, and there's, so if you're talking about the word, you're talking about God, you're talking about God, you're talking about the word, and there's no difference, no error, no nothing between those two. Amen. Now, 
I told you that pistis or faith is complete trust in whatever is God has said to be the truth. Therefore, the Bible then is the most important book to mankind. And the Bible is hated by those who hate God, who hate God's rules, and who hate God's methods. Now turn to Genesis chapter 1. Can I get three hallelujahs to get started? <laughs> In the book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 1, uh, we'll read here uh, with verse 1. Praise his holy name. Thank you, Jesus. The page don't want to turn. I don't had this Bible for so long. That's what I quoted then. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Uh, amen? Now, verse 2 is where I'm going. And in verse 2, it says this, that the earth was null and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The next verse says, and then the Spirit of, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, the earth being null and void is what? Darkness is what? Chaos. The earth, before God spoke his word and straightened it out, was total and complete chaos. How does God deal with chaos? Well, you read the rest of chapter 1. And God said, like being, God said, firmament being. God said, amen. In other words, what straightens out chaos, what brings order, amen, is the word of God. The word of God removes chaos and it brings order. Any system in the earth operating outside of the word brings disorder and chaos. Now, praise the Lord, turn to Exodus since you're nearby. Exodus chapter 17. Let's read a little bit about Moses here for a moment. <clears throat> we'll read her in verse 5. The Lord said unto Moses, go on, go on before the people, take with thee the elders of Israel and your rod, wherewith you smote the rivers that's in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock of Horeb. Thou shalt smite or hit the rock. And there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and we know what happened. Water came out of the rock enough to quench the thirst of nearly three million people. Then if you go to Numbers later on, here's another situation that takes place where the people are also complaining again because they're thirsty. Amen. Amen. And in verse 7, the Lord speaks unto Moses again. He said, take that same rod, gather thou the assembly together, you and Aaron thy brother, and speak, underline, speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. Thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so, that, so thou shalt give the congregation and the beast drink. Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before that rock and said, here now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he hit the rock twice. But what did the Lord tell him to do? He said, speak to it. He said, I didn't tell you to hit it. And the water came out abundantly. The congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because ye believe me not. Now hear what God said. Because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Whoa. Now, first of all, God told him, yeah, you take the rod in your hand, but I don't want you to, I don't, I want you to speak to this this time. Don't hit it. Moses hit it. He didn't hit it once, he hit it twice, and God told us why he did it. He did it, uh, praise God, because he wasn't sure that if he spoke to it, he'd have the same result. And then he hit it twice, because the first time, I guess nothing seemed to happen. And he hit it the second time, amen. God was not pleased, but he wanted to bless the people with the water. So he provided them with the water, 
but he had a discussion with Moses. And he told Moses, now you don't get to go into the promised land after all that Moses went through. Think about that. I mean, Moses in the burning bush. Moses before peril. Moses and the Red Sea party. And now, you don't get to go into the promised land? Nope. Why? Under much is given, much is required. See, I, I talked about mercy several weeks ago. And God said, he said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will not have mercy on whom I will not have mercy. He reserved that to himself. Amen. And so, well, uh, amen. When you, you remember when you first got born again and, and you opened up the Bible and it fell right to the scripture you needed. And all of a sudden, y'all remember that, what you said. Now, you open the Bible, it don't fall to that. What happened? You were a baby Christian. And so you were a baby. God would treat you help you along, but he expected you to grow. He expected you to mature, and he would not continue to treat you like a baby when you are, got grown pants on. I told you there's a problem, you know what I mean? I got grandchildren that's one years old, you know. I don't mind changing her diaper when she's one. I don't mind changing her diaper at one, but I ain't changing her diaper when she's 18. Right? You expect it's going to be a growth. Moses is accountable to God, and God said, I expect you to believe me, and you don't, just because things change methodology, just because the method changed, what's that got to do with my power? So Moses is not going to get to go to the promised land, and this is the reason why, but there's also another reason why he didn't get to go in. Turn to the book of Numbers chapter 14. Amen. In Numbers 14, now you remember what happened in Numbers 13. Uh, the 12 uh, tribes were sent by Moses into the promised land. Uh, ten of them came back with an evil report, which was a report of unbelief. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb said, let's go on two right now, let's take it. We are well able to overcome it. The Lord is with us. Their bread is, uh, their defense is bread for us and all that. Amen. Amen. But did you notice there were not two voices that spoke up, two other voices? Moses and Aaron did not speak up. Moses and Aaron did not stand up for God. Joshua and Caleb did. Moses and Aaron didn't. The other reason why they didn't get to go. And so unbelief is not just not trust and confidence. Unbelief also leads you to not stand up for God in front of a hostile crowd. Now, praise God. Living by faith. Remember Hebrews 10, 38 said, the just shall live by faith. I didn't say the just shall use their faith here. He said the just shall live by faith. Living by faith is this. It's adopting God's values and views of the world rather than man's humanistic systems. In fact, one of the names for God's system on the earth is found in Matthew 6.33. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. God has a system. That system is also called the basilia of God. The Basilia of Theos is called, praise God, the kingdom of God, a system. What you've already learned now through five weeks of me teaching on this is that there, there is a system that God has laid out, and it's, un, it's up to you to learn the system, Amen. to then operate the system. Amen. Hallelujah. Because he is the God of order yes. and not a God of disorder. Amen. I remember when I first opened this church and run, I still run it the way I used to run it 40 years ago. I haven't changed and people criticized me. They said, he runs that church like a business. I said, well, what else am I supposed to run? It? About, am I supposed to run it with disorder? This is God's stuff. I mean, God don't have no disorder. Hello, somebody. I thank God my eyes are not here and one here and none of the feet and yours be in your chest somewhere. I mean, God has a system and way of order. Come on now. 
So you know, so Satan knows all this. So when you hear God's word, Satan will immediately challenge the word that you hear. Why? Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know that. Amen. So the word is the basis for all faith. Amen. And remember what Mark 9, 23 says. It says, all things are possible to him that believeth. Now Satan knows that. So Satan knows if these folk get to walking by faith and then they learn how to use their faith, there's nothing I can do to stop them. And so Jesus told you about the parable of Mark chapter 4. If you don't know Mark chapter 4 by now and you've been, you've been around me, I don't know what to say to you. If you've not read that parable of the sower, Jesus talked about there were four different types of ground. In, in short, okay, amen, all, of, all these were people, praise God, and they all, every one of them heard the word. Amen. But there were five instances before people. The first one, they heard the word but they didn't receive it. So Satan didn't have to do anything. That's people that go, I hear, but please. And so they go on. The second group heard the word and Satan didn't challenge them with, as the scripture said, affliction, which is pressure through all kinds of circumstances coming against you. And then the next one was persecution. That, that's when God takes people Groups of people. Amen. Yeah. He takes people and he uses people to try and make you back off that word. Yeah. He uses people against you. And the words said there in Mark chapter 4, of course, if you follow me, that's 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. I'm talking about Mark 4. And it said over there uh, that they became offended because of the pressure by circumstances and people. And they became, that word offended means uh, in the Greek is scandalizo. And they became people who backed up, yeah. quit, yeah. even became tempted to sin. Uh -huh. That's what happened to them. See? So Satan does this because he knows, amen, walking or walking by faith. If I let them walk by faith, they will power through whatever circumstance. They will just power through whatever people get in their face about. They're still just power with God. He knows. He said, I got to crush them before they get strong enough to do that. The third one was cares of this world. That word cares is merinna in the Greek. And that's the word distractions. And so if he couldn't stop you with the power game, then he'll find something else to get your interest. There's anything to keep you from your focus being on the word of God. Get your focus on race, get your focus on money, get your focus on people, get your focus on something else, whether it's the government. He get, he get your focus off of what God said and get distracted from the word. So then, since faith comes by hearing about the word of God, well, the, the next one was deceitfulness of riches. Not riches, but being deceived by that. And what that is is a person uh, who doesn't believe that God really can meet their needs. And then the fifth one was lust of other things, entering in, choked the word, make it unfruitful. And that lust of other things is, is when something then becomes so important to you that it becomes the ascendant number one thing instead of the word of God. You just got to have it instead of have the word. Then in verse 20 of Mark 4, it said, Though they that are on the good ground, of course, do do five things. They hear the word, receive the word, believe the word, speak the word, and act on the word, bring forth fruit a hundredfold. Okay, amen. amen. Praise God. Now, when you understand this, turn to 1 Kings chapter 22. Let's keep on the Old Testament for a minute. Give me three more hallelujah somebody. <laughs> now, I'm going somewhere with this. Amen. You may, you may not like it. But I'm going anyway. First Kings 22, uh, let's read verse 7. Now, Jehoshaphat here, before I read it, Jehoshaphat gets in the league with the king of Israel. The king of it, remember, Israel has, back in those days, or now they were not like they are now. You just have one nation of Israel. But you used to have two nations. You had the northern part called Israel, southern part called Judah. So if you read in the Old Testament, the southern part was 
uh, or Judah was, you know, Jerusalem down. And then you had the southern part, okay, going up to Galilee and all of that, right? And so you had the northern part, the king of Israel. He gets into a, an agreement with the southern king, Jehoshaphat. They are looking to go to, they're looking at going to war, to go fight together against somebody. Verse 7, Jehoshaphat said, now, is there a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? In other words, before we jump into this, let's ask God about it. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, now, there's one man, Micaiah, or Micah, we would say, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. Why do you hate him? Because he don't prophesy good concerning me every time. Every time he prophesies to me, he prophesies some evil. <laughs> now, the reason why, by the way, every time the king of Israel got prophesied to by Micah was because the king of Israel was evil. And he refused to change his evil ways. So every time he called for Micah, Micah, the Lord would call him out through Micah. He came to a place where he confused God and the man. So he focused on the man instead on God's word given to the man. And he said, I hate the man. But what he didn't understand was he was hating God. Well, so verse 9, king of Israel gets an officer and sends him down there and save time. Uh, and, and, and so that messenger gets down to verse 13 where Micah is. And he said, now look now, all the other prophets, they've all said to the king what he wants to hear. All the other prophets said, go ahead, king, you're going to win, you can go to war. Now, Micah, I'm telling you, you better line up. That's what it is. Read the story. He said, he said, you better line up and you better say the same thing. Micah said, we'll see. <laughs> so they get in front of the king, you know, and finally the king says, he got the two kings there. And finally the king says, all right, Mike, what you got to say this time? And Micah said, oh, yeah, you're going to win the battle. And the king says, it must have been the way he did it. He said, I told you stop playing with me. Just tell me what you got from God. He said, you're going to get your butt kicked if you go down there. <laughs> what is it? Uh, I'm just putting it in the Detroit language. But he said, he said if you go down there, you're going to get your butt kicked. Verse 18. And the king of Israel said to Josaphat, didn't I tell you that he prophesied nothing good concerning me? Every time he sees me, he's prophesying love. Now, the reason why God had the prophet constantly say something to the king of Israel that seemingly in the king of Israel's view was negative. It was because God loved the king of Israel. And he wanted the king of Israel to get straightened out. And the only way he was going to get straightened out was from the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord will first of all tell you what your problem is. And if you choose to receive it, then it will also then give you revelation of what to do to get out of the problem. But you only get the second part only when you hear it and receive it. Believe it's speaking and then act like a song. Amen. And so what happened is that you see this all over the Old Testament. Many prophets were killed. Jesus even said it. Jesus said, you killed the prophets. They killed many prophets because they didn't like what was said. So they kept on focusing on the prophets. God would speak to Israel through the prophet. The prophet's nothing but a mouthpiece. The minister is nothing but a mouthpiece. Amen. If you listen to the Holy Ghost, you get it from the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is the one doing the talking. The scripture was even written that way. Are you listening to me? Uh, amen. But they killed the prophets. I guess the reason why they killed the prophets, thinking we killed the prophets, then it will change what was said. No, it won't. But they got mad at the prophet anyway. Now, turn to Romans chapter 10. Once again, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The word is the basis for everything, especially God's order. I'll tell you what, say some time. 
Go back to that Genesis chapter one. I save a little time because I got I got to get where I'm going. Amen. You know these verses anyway. Praise God. So we get back to Genesis chapter one. Praise God. That page still don't want to turn. All right. So we see God then brings order where there's disorder through his word. Then he gets the man. What does he say about man on day six? God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion, let them rule, over fish of the sea, fowl of the air, cattle, over all the earth, any and everything that even creeps. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female. Created he them. So God's view of order for man was for there to be a male and a female. This is the only distinction God made with humans. I want you to notice he didn't say anything about skin color. Right? When you get into the ark, you know, you get to chapter 6 and uh, going into the ark over there in verse 19, and what did God tell Noah in the ark when he restarted? He said, I want you to get two of everything, one male, one female, bring them into the ark. We start all over again. So again, we see that God's purpose was male and female so that they could be fruitful, they could multiply, they could have children. Now, this is the reason why last spring I jumped all over Black Lives Matter. This is why I did. And the reason why I did was I told you. So, I mean, we're here. I told you. What did I tell you? Get your cell phone out, right? Get the tablet out. Okay, I had mine. I said, let's turn, let's read their words out loud together. So, one my words. We read their words. What we saw was that they were a Marxist, Marxist organization. Marxism, Marxist Leninism, socialism is what? It is man's system to replace God. With man as the head of mankind and not God. We read, it said, that it was a transgender organization. Not male, not female, but some different methodology. Completely against God's order. Then we read, it said, and we want the destruction of the nuclear family. Now, they don't took this off their website now because they got so much heat. But the nuclear family was what? A father, a mother, and kids. Now, God's word brings order. Going against God's word brings disorder. So you have chaos when you don't know what is a man and what's a woman. You have chaos when five-year-olds are told, choose the sex you want to be. You have chaos when school teachers are required to call a child, not by what they are, but by whatever it is they decide to say. You have chaos, which is what you have now. Chaos. And let me tell you, these systems are against God's word total. Amen. Now, I'll show you how far they go, right to the north of us. It's Canada. I founded a church in, through the Lord. I founded a church in Toronto. I pastored it for two years. Then I handed it over to the wards who are pastoring it. They're Word of Faith Christian Center. Toronto, Canada. Now, last Sunday, the wards were here. Now, one of the things that they told me was what's going on in Canada, a so-called democratic country like the United States, has a constitution, and so forth and so on. 
Well, there was a man there who his daughter decided she wanted to be a male. So she wanted him to call her by a male pronoun. He refused to call his daughter a man. She told the school. The school called the police. The police arrested the man. He has now been sentenced to two years in prison for refusing to call his daughter a male. That's where you're headed. A complete repudiation of God's way, which brings about chaos in socialistic terms. Children do not belong to you. Children belong to the state. And since they belong to the state, since they are wars of the state, the state can tell you what you can and cannot do with your child. Despite the fact that Ephesians chapter three, uh, chapter six, verse three tells you, fathers, bring your children up and nurture, nurture and admonition of the Lord. Despite the fact that Proverbs twenty two six says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Amen. 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 But in their minds, children don't belong to you. That's why they push laws to allow minor children to have abortions. Abortion is not a political issue. Abortion is not a Republican or Democratic issue. Abortion did not start in 1973 with Roe v. Wade. Are you kidding me? It's a biblical issue. Don't you know Jeremiah? Thousands of years before the United States ever showed up. Jeremiah 1.5, God said to Jeremiah, he said, I have called you in the womb and called you to be a prophet to the nations. The United States were never thought of. The children of Israel lost their promised land for two reasons and were banished for 2,000 years over two issues. One was worship of Baal and the worship of Baal or Baal, the worship of Baal involved Children. You ever read what Jesus said about what happens if you mess with children? Ever read Matthew 18? It's better that a millstone or hung about your neck. And those two things cause God said, that's enough and that's it. And they had judgment and they were banished from their homeland for 2,000 years. Better watch what you do with children. And that's why they want to do so many things, drugs, shots, everything without parental consent. Because as far as they're concerned, your children do not belong to you. Now, Paul prophesied this. Turn to Romans chapter 1. I said, I knew you weren't going to like this. But I'm just a messenger. I do what I'm told. Romans chapter 1, he says here in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, and that's, that's living by faith. Amen. Living by faith means I am not ashamed of the gospel, nor will I back up, nor will I keep silent. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto all salvation, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. The righteousness of God's revealed from faith to faith and is written, the just shall live by faith. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. That word hope there means they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Why? Because that which may be known of God is apparent unto them. He gets down in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. They were not thankful. They became foolish in their imaginations. Their foolish heart became dark. Professing them wives to be, uh, themselves to be very smart, they became fools. 
and on and on and on. Amen. What you have is a clash of two wills going on. There is the will of God. And that will, as we read, follow his laws, will make you, praise God, prosperous, healthy, live long. And then there's Satan's will, which as far as we read last week, works of the flesh, where there were lots of anger. Half of those works of the flesh were things of anger. Because Satan loves anger because it helps him have chaos and helps him be able to live and express himself in the earth. Amen. 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 It is a replacement of God's wisdom for man. Sometimes we call that government. Now turn to Proverbs chapter 1. I got the one amen. I'm grateful for it. Thank you, brother. That was a brother. Thank you. <laughs> then in Proverbs chapter 1, what about, see, see, living by faith, the just shall live by faith, living by faith is putting God, and remember, there is no distinction between God and his word. Amen. It's putting God and God's methods and ways above any and everything else. Amen. He said in Isaiah 55, my thoughts are above yours and my ways are above yours. Amen. 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 So, um, so whatever area you want to talk about, that's how if you're actually a faith person, living by faith is this. Let's, take a, let's just take an example. Let's just take the nation of Israel, for example. God gave the land of Israel by tribes. Remember they went into the promised land? He gave it to them by tribes with Joshua and Caleb thousands of years ago. King David made Jerusalem the capital of the nation of Israel 3,500 years ago according to the Bible. So then how can they be illegitimate occupiers of the land that God gave them? The entire Bible and the system of God, the whole system of God revolves around the Jewish people and revolves around the city of Jerusalem. It was a Jew who gave you every scripture you got in there. Your Messiah was a At the front of the Bible and at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelations, you know what it says, the book of Revelations? It said over there that things will be wound up at the battle of Armageddon. Where? Israel. I've taken some of you there to the valley of Magado. The Antichrist will set up shop in the rebuilt temple and desecrate it. The armies from the east, the oriental armies, China and all of its folk, the European armies of the Antichrist will descend to snuff out Israel and God will come and defend her right outside. And the Bible said the blood shall be all the way up to the horse's bridle for miles. But it ends with Israel. And then when it said there's a new heaven, a new earth, guess what God calls the capital city? The new what? Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, is the capital city of the world, and Israel is the capital nation of the world, Amen. says the Bible. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Let me give you another one. Another one to just think about. I'm giving you some stuff just to think about the proper responses to the issues of the day. Have you ever read in the Bible that slavery was the norm for society during the times of Jesus and Paul? You ever read that slavery did not start in America? It didn't start in the 19th century, 18th century, 17th century, 16th century. You know, in the first century, the apostle Paul wrote a letter, as did Peter, to slaves 
telling them how to act with your masters. But we can go even further than that. How about going just a little bit further than that? The children of Israel in Egypt were what? Slaves. Slaves. I'll do you one better. Let's go even, even further than that. Uh, turn to Genesis chapter 17. <clears throat> the whole world had slavery. Not just Europe. In fact, the, the Bible lessons about slavery was all about slavery in the Middle East. But the entire world had slavery. It was in not only the Middle East, it was in Europe. Slavery was in Africa, Africans enslaving Africans. It was in the Orient. The entire world had slavery until recent times. You understand that 245 years the United States has been around. The United States is a baby nation compared to the rest of the nations of the world. I go to nations that have been around 3,000 years. Well, here's one for you. Genesis chapter 17, let's read verse 23. And it's 18, and here we go. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that was born in his house and all that were bought with his money. Are you telling me that Abraham had slaves? Yep. He had servants and slaves. He had both. Now, should we then cancel Abraham and tear out every reference to Abraham in the Bible? I just want you to think. I want you to open your brain. Instead of just running off with everything, something come along. Hey, you. Well, if you do cancel Abraham, let me tell you, you don't have Jesus. And neither are you saved. Because Abraham entered into a covenant with God and Abraham was willing to offer his son and God said cause of that covenant now I have to offer mine Jesus in Matthew 1 is called the son of David and son of Abraham in Abraham's lineage are prostitutes and all kind of people are in his lineage what, what did we learn God has always used imperfect people to move the ball forward. And if he didn't use imperfect people, the ball would never get moved forward because there are no perfect people. Now I'm going to give you how you're supposed to look at this. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. It's not that God counting is wrong. Amen. It's that, amen, God's view of things is a little different than ours. And when he says sin, there's always a price to be paid for it. Everyone who entered into slavery paid a price down the road because it was wrong, including America. America's price was so bad. The estimate was of dead not injured, dead. I'm a history guy. The estimate is 750,000 people killed in the Civil War. Now you gotta remember that the United States was only a quarter the size of it, that it is now. That meant then, that's just killed. We ain't talking about maimed or injured. They don't have no number for that, it was so many. They have no number. They didn't have a Veterans Administration to take care of people. So if someone was, had lost their limbs in war, they had to use whatever money they had. Every house in America had a male kill. Every family paid a price for that slavery. And not only that, 
It took the South a hundred years to recover. Because the wage of sin is death. I'm not done yet. You're going to stay here. So how are you supposed to look at this? Take a look at chapter 6, verse 8 of Genesis. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Well, why didn't you just say that Noah was perfect? Well, what do you mean perfect in his generations? What does that mean? It means that among the people that Noah grew up with, yes. Noah was right among whatever was the social norms of the day. Amen. Let me give you a basketball NBA illustration. <laughs> now, I am not equating, for those of you on the internet, I am not equating the NBA with slavery. But, for many of you, especially guys, they will get the point. People my age believe, generally, that the greatest basketball player of all time was Michael Jordan. <clears throat> guys my age call him the GOAT, greatest of all time. My sons-in-laws, they're 40. They believe LeBron James is the greatest of all time. Now, these are two different eras. Back when Michael Jordan was playing, the Detroit Pistons were back-to-back -back champions. And they had something they deployed against him called the Jordan Rules. The Jordan Rules were, if Michael Jordan came in the paint, you know, in front of the basket, they have painted the floor. They called that the paint. And if Michael Jordan came in the paint, the Jordan rules were to send him to the hospital. <laughs> right? Especially with Rick Mahorn and Bill Lambeer. And he came in there, wham! They pow! And Michael Jordan used to scream to the NBA about how those champion Detroit Pistons beat his butt every time he played them. Now, I saw this year okay, a playoff game where the analysts for the game, and they're running a replay, and they said, yep, he touched the man's clothes, so it's a foul. I wonder. If Michael Jordan played under the current rules, what he would have done then. The point I'm making is that you can't compare different eras. See, th this current era could say that the Pistons were barbarians. <laughs> Their titles should be illegitimate and taken from them because they did all of these flagrant fouls against Michael Jordan. Understand? The people in their day operated by what was the social norms of the day. Why would you tear down the Abraham Lincoln statue when he set the prayer, the slaves free? I call that stupidity gone ignorant. <laughs> While I'm at it, <laughs> I'm here now. I don't care about the clock either, so not today I don't. <clears throat> what about evan the hated evangelical Christians? What's an evangelical Christian? The word evangelical means someone who witnesses. An evangelical Christian is someone who tells other people that Jesus lives, 
hung on a cross, died, rose from the grave. That's what an evangelical Christian is. They do Matthew 28. Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, do I have any Christians in here? Do you tell anybody about Jesus? You are an evangelical Christian. And they are hated by Satan. Why? Because they stand in the way of his world domination. I'm going to come down the home stretch. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Was standing in the way of Satan being able to get his goal. Satan has a goal. His goal is total domination of the earth. <clears throat> he still believes he can have control of the world. The apostle Paul, through the Holy Ghost, prophesied about this event. He says in the second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, and he says here, verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know that which withholdeth that he might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The he will be taken out of the way or caught up or raptured. Who are the he? The church. Ephesians chapter 1 said we are the body of Christ. Amen. Said he's the head, we are the body. In Revelations, it calls the new Jerusalem. Uh, amen. Over there, it says that the new Jerusalem is called the, is not called the bride of Christ. The church is not the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is a city. The church is the part of Jesus. He's the head, we're the body. There is a rapture coming. There is a catching away of God's people. Only then will Satan be able to do what he's trying to do. Only then when the salt of the earth is removed from all human contact. Only then will Satan be able to bring up an antichrist. He can't come until we are out of here. Therefore, he hates us. So the law of faith is far, far more than believing the promises of God to get healed. It's far more than believing the promises of God to be prosperous or have finances or have victory in some area. Living by faith is receiving God and his word at the highest and only legitimate answer in life. Courageously. Standing up for him in his word. Applying God's five elements of faith for your personal life. I read you Hebrews 11 chapter. Faith's Hall of Fame. And every one of them it talked about. How they went places God told them to go and they didn't even know how. How they came up against opposition and how they stood. They were the ones in the Faith Hall of Fame. They lived by faith. Stand up please. Kind of preached my voice out today is my second service. <clears throat> Let's lift our hands and give God praise for the word. Father, we thank you for the word. We give you praise and glory and honor for the word. Yes. The Lord told me, he just told me. He said, I want you to remind him of one verse, son. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all care upon him for he cares for you. You know, someone wrote me just the other day <clears throat> and they, they wrote me to get on my case about, you know, uh, speaking about a certain group of people. And I'll tell you my reply. 
How many know God loves you? Yes. Just like he loved the king of Israel. So if a group of people have the highest rate of poverty and they have, same group, have the highest rate of sickness and disease and they have the lowest life expectancy. In other words, they die earlier than everybody else. That's called poverty, sickness, death. That's called in the Bible, the curse. Proverbs says, the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, there is a reason. So then, guess what God would do? God would then again and again and again bring the word to those people first to tell them you're operating under the law of death yeah. secondly how to get out of that law yeah. and he will do it like he did the king of Israel even the people say and never say nothing good about us <laughs> stop your wicked ways it'll be something good to say Yeah, they flooded our neighborhoods with drugs and they drugged us. Even if they flood your neighborhood with drugs, that don't mean you got to take them. <laughs> I'm going to take two minutes. When my family, my parents lived in the hood before they made it. When they lived in the hood, we lived in the hood, two doors down from me was a drug dealer. Now, my daddy's sitting over there. He told me. I don't even know if he remembers this, but I certainly remember it. <laughs> he told me, if I hear your feet walk up their sidewalk, he didn't have to finish the sentence. I got it. Amen. Right? So I will never forget this. I'm about nine years old or something like that. Right? I don't know. Eight, nine. And there's two doors down, and I can remember I was walking past their house. See, he told me don't go up that, you know. So I'm walking past their house, and they had, back in those days, the ride in the hood was the deuce in the court. Yeah. Anybody remember the deuce in the court? So there was a deuce in the quarter sitting there in the driveway, and there was two honeys sitting there in hot, hot, hot pants. And go-go boots. I'll never forget. I'm walking past and they said, hey, honey. I can't do that. Honey, y'all get it. Honey, you so cute. You so cute. We just want to hug you. Come on over here, boy. They sit on the back of this convertible to do some the corner. And boy, they was fine. I mean, like, they was like, dog, right? And I see them and they tell me to come. And I heard the voice of my daddy. <laughs> A big problem is that you don't have men in the home. <laughs> so I never touched drugs. I was too afraid to do so. I was afraid of my daddy. I wasn't afraid of my mama. I love her, but I wasn't afraid of her. <laughs> I mean, especially when I got about 12, I was bigger than she was. You know, so mama would be, mama be beating you. I told you, no, she was telling you. Mama be beating you, you know, and you'd be like, I ain't gonna cry. You know, you know, no boys, I ain't gonna cry. Oh, you ain't gonna cry. <laughs> so then daddy come out. Daddy ain't gonna hit you 10 times. He ain't gonna hit you 15 times. Just two. And oh, baby, fire from on high. I raised three kids along with Pastor Deborah. My kids knew. I don't care what's in front of you. If I ever hear you took drugs, 
This is going to be a coming to Jesus meeting with your daddy. Huh? I've only fathered three kids. My three kids all serve God. Man, I need it. And woman, if that man ain't going to marry you, don't give it up. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't tore it now. Every head bowed. <clears throat> every eye closed in prayer. God loves you and he has made a way for your deliverance. It's right there in the word of God. Okay, come up here. Give this, give this altar call for me. Praise the name of the Lord. If you're in the auditorium this morning, we want you to know, first of all, how much Jesus loves you. God is not mad at you. He's never been mad at you. He's been waiting on you all of this time to come to him because he will in no wise cast you out. So if you're in the auditorium this morning and you have never, ever made Jesus the Lord of your life, today is your day. I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about listening to church music. I'm talking about have you ever gave your heart to the Lord? Have you ever said, I now take Jesus for my Savior? If you haven't done that, we're offering Jesus this morning. Amen? I'm going to offer you another proposition. If you're here in the building this morning and you are out of fellowship, I want you to understand something about God. Sin breaks fellowship, not the relationship. You're as much God's kid as you ever were. However, you do need to get your fellowship restored, and that we can do in a matter of minutes as well. God's not mad at you either. He's been trying to get you all of this time to come back and make it right with him so that your life will be blessed. Amen? So if you're in here today, and you're not born again. You're out of fellowship. That means that you're not living a godly lifestyle. If you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, with the Bible evidence of speaking with other tongues, you are living beneath your privilege when you cannot pray in the Spirit. So I want you to know that we have counselors that can sit with you and expound the Word of God to you in a way that'll, that'll let you know that speaking in other tongues is what you really need to go along with the salvation. Amen? So if you're in here today, now listen very carefully to me. If you need to be born again, that means you have never said, I now take Jesus for my Savior. If you are out of fellowship, you haven't been living for God, You've already been saved, but you're out of fellowship. Or if you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost, with the Bible evidence of speaking in other tongues, if you fit any of those criteria, I want you to step out into the nearest aisle and come down here right now as we give you a hand. Come on. Come on, let's come. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Won't you come? Come now. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Wait, 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 wait. Now, wait a minute. I know in my spirit there, there are at least several men in this congregation that are in this church, and you come all the time, 
but you are out of fellowship. The Lord wants you to restore that fellowship today. Not only you, but if it's an issue with the friend sitting beside you, your friend can't help you with this. You're going to have to come for yourself. Amen. If you need help coming, I will come personally come down there and get you if that's what you need. Now, I'm getting ready to change the song. And this is a song that we're going to sing, Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus right now. Come to Jesus. Come on, let's sing it. Come to Jesus. Come on. Come to Jesus. Come now. Right now. Come on, fellas. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Right now. Oh, he will say. Won't you trust him? What is he saying? Can't hear it. Can't hear it. Won't you trust him right now? Won't you trust him? Won't you trust him right now? We're talking to the online people as well. We haven't forgotten about you. If you're online this morning and you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life, you, there's, a, there's a thing right online where you can click in if you need salvation. If that's you, we're talking to you too. We're talking to you for out of fellowship. So just follow the directions online that they are telling you to do. And we'll, you will, you'll be, we'll be born again and we'll get you that information that you need as well. Amen? Okay, now this is what we're going to do. Because this is, this is what keeps coming up in my spirit. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to count. And I'm going to start at 37. And what we're going to do is we're going to count backwards until we get down to zero. Now, every time, if somebody steps out in the aisle and starts down here, we're going to... Okay, y'all, come on. You coming? Come on. Come on. Son already started. Son already started. It's done already started. It's done already started. You want to get in on this? I'm telling you, it's already started. The anointing is present to break the yoke. It's already started. It started with his sermon. Don't you understand that we want you free? We want you free. So, in other words, when, all right, now when they start coming now, we're going to stop, we're going to dance, we're going to shout, we're going to scream. If you want to run, that's fine. And then we're going to pick up back with that number until we get down to zero. Are you ready? Say yes. yes. All right, let's count. 37. 36, Come on. 35, Come on. 34, Those of you who are coming, hurry up, hurry up. Come on. Come on. Come on now. Come on, we're waiting for you. We're waiting for you. Come on. All right. All right, we're getting lower. Come on, y'all. 18. 17. 16. 15. 14. 13. 12. Come on. We're almost out of time. Eight. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Let's give a shout. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I know what you're thinking. You didn't give but one. Let me tell you something, sweetie. That's one more that the devil don't have. It doesn't help. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to send you out with our counselors, and they're going to minister to you regarding to what you came for.
But what I want you to do right now is rent one, raise one hand towards heaven where your help comes from. And repeat this after me. I now take Jesus for my Savior. I do believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ he is the Son of God. I believe he died for me on Calvary's tree, bearing my sins for me. I believe that he rose and is alive today. Dear Lord Jesus, come to my heart right now and save me now. I believe in my heart. Therefore, I say with my mouth that Jesus Christ is right now my personal Lord and Savior. And I am right now born again. Give it up, folks. <laughs>